Greetings, my name is Jonathan Sarna. I direct the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies here at Brandeis, and it's really my great pleasure uh, to welcome you to the first of this year's Schusterman Seminars in Israel Studies. Uh, this year, as many as possible of our seminars will be held hybrid fashion. Some members of our Brandeis community here in person and hundreds around the world uh, joining us uh, through the magic of Zoom. Uh, I'm grateful uh, to my colleague, uh, Rima Farah, who is just completing her PhD here at Brandeis uh, for helping us out. And uh, she will be monitoring the chat for, um, uh, for any questions that you may have. And uh, uh, then we'll be monitoring and, uh, and moderating those questions uh, later on. Uh, but now uh, let me introduce our distinguished speaker, uh, uh, Professor um, Matt Silver is a professor of modern Jewish history at the Max Stern uh, Yisrael Valley College in Israel. Um, he is spending the fall semester as a visiting scholar uh, here at the Schusterman Center. Uh, many of you uh, know his work published under the name M.M. M. Silver. It covers topics in Zionism, in American Jewish history, and unusually for the field, uh, it includes volumes written both in English and in Hebrew. Uh, his books include a volume on Leon Uris and Exodus, uh, a big book uh, which won many awards, a biography of Louis Marshall, and most recently, a multi-volume history of the Galil, the Galilee region uh, in Israel. Um, Professor uh, Silver was uh, born in the United States. Uh, he did his PhD at the Hebrew University with uh, our friend and colleague, Professor Eli Letterhandler. And he has taught truly around the world at Oxford, at Ohio State, uh, and at other universities in North America and Europe. Uh, he lives uh, in, uh, in Safed, in Svat, and his topic today is entitled The Jewish Bookshelf from the Six-Day War to the Yom Kippur War. Welcome, Professor Silver. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm, uh, thank you in many, many ways, both to uh, Professor Sarna and to the Schusterman Center, I'm just thrilled to be here a year ago when this idea came up. I wasn't sure that for various reasons I'd be able to make it, and I'm just delighted to, to, to be here. And I have a kind of hardworking uh, talk today and uh, to kind of uh, give something back uh, for this invitation. Um, the subtitle, which if anybody wants to ask of this, is uh, How I Got a Black Eye by the Ghost of Philip Roth. But that's a different story, and uh, maybe I'll tell that after uh, this talk. What kind of books are being written about Israel in months and years after the June 67 war and a period of unprecedented confidence and enthusiasm regarding the present and future of the, Jew of the Jewish state? The natural stopping point for such a critical bibli bibliographic discussion is October 73, when the startling initial setbacks of the Yom Kippur War fundamentally altered discourse within Israel and about Israel. To some extent, the rapidly developing events in the 1970s, the demise of the Labor Party, the rise of the Likud Party, privatization, religious Zionism, 
consolidation of what we call the special relationship between Israel and the United States, stemming from the Kissinger-Nixon sanctioned airlift of supplies in the later phases of the 73 war, and the settlement controversy, of course, co co caused by the ascendance of the Gushimoni movement after 73, were anticip anticipated by writers in this crucial six-year post-six-day war period, but that is not really the focus of this talk. My most basic contention here is that when we write about Jewish history, we too often search for prophets rather than a search for processes. When post-67 Jewish history was written by commentators who had a secular center leftist, then mainstream viewpoint, the brief exercise are we undertaking today became largely irrelevant. For them, there was really only one canonical book on the 6773 shelf, uh, what's called in Hebrew, Siach Lochamim, the seventh day, soldiers talk about the Sixth Day War, a text uh, reportedly assembled from the kibbutz grassroots and which documented conversations among, among mostly kibbutz fighters who participated in the war and quickly came to terms with its impending moral legacy in the newly conquered territories and beyond them. The book's editing is attributed to Abraham Shapiro with an, in, its English translation credited to Henry Neer, a serious scholar who had a probable interest in disseminating what he likely regarded as the enduring moral probity of the kibbutz movement. And the book is regarded as having demystified, simplistic, heroic perceptions of the Six Day War and of conveying a prophetic Jewish sensibility by which the fruits of military triumph are fraught perilously with the potential of becoming moral spoils. All that might be true, though I think many would find the way this book has been remembered and lionized in Israel's secular left culture as being propagandistic and morally self-serving. At any event, this singularly canonical or prophetic book doesn't really make a strong case about the novelty of the 67 experience. As I think is demonstrated by many, if not all of the books I will be talking about today, the voices in the seventh day volume are really echoes of longstanding currents in Zionist and Jewish culture, and they need to be heard in contexts that elude simple, simple temporal or even disciplinary coordinates. Again and again on the Jewish bookshelf in this uh, six year period, a volume which seems to be talking about religion is also talking about economics or a book which is talking about war is also talking about education. Before I get into the specific points, this is a way of framing as a counterpoint, counterpoint to this book I mentioned now, Siach Lochamim, and because of the recently departed status of the author, I thought I'd mention a novella by Aleph Bet Yeshua that he published in 1971, called Early in the Summer of 1970. Yeshua's story relates to a 70-year-old high school Bible teacher who was informed that his 30-year-old son, an academic who has returned to Israel after completing a PhD in the US, has been killed while on reserve duty in the Jordan Valley. The story is about mistaken identity caused by ID dog tag shuffling precipitated by the son who comes across as a military shlamazel. Yeshua, no doubt, used this plot to pinprick myths of IDF inv invincibility that were surging after 1967, but he was also raising larger issues about Jewish competency for warfare, which reached back to the skeptical tradition of early Yiddish Hebrew writing in the Mendele Mocher Sforim mo mode. On my reading, Yeshua's story problematizes education, no less than the Six-Day War triumph, and the way its key figure, the retiring high school teacher, ruminates existentially about whether his own lesson plans might possibly capture something meaningful about the chaotic meandering of Jewish history evokes Chaim Chazaz's 1942 story, The Sermon. Before I begin rap a rapid fire cataloging of titles, some of them fairly well known, others forgotten but nonetheless revealing, written by Israeli and American Jewish writers in this 67, 73 period, that have Israel as its main topic or as an important topic. I'll try to be as specific as I can about the claims I am entertaining. Not all of them could possibly be proven in a breathless survey of this sort, but I'll be pointing in their direction. Appropriately enough in a bibliographic talk about responses to the Six Day War, I have six points to make. First, from moral, political, political and aesthetic standpoints, this is far from the most ennobling or inspiring bookshelf to be found in, in major periods of Jewish history. Bottom line, Jews don't know how to write about triumph. They know how to write about cat catastrophe. Significantly, only one volume produced in this period attained classic status in the fictional or non-fictional realm, this being Philip Ross' 1969 comic novel, Port Noise Complaint, which in the Israeli context is violently antagonistic, if not rapacious. 
In almost all the other volumes, the writers can be seen reaching the wrong conclusions or ironically reaching plausible solutions after displaying an inability to pose the right questions. For Jews, this post-67 period was many things, but not one which left a particularly insightful bookshelf. On this high intellectual elite level, I think the survey would substantiate history volumes about recent Jewish history that have chapter headings like the failure of the Jewish intellectuals, and which suggest, suggests that in Jewish culture, nothing written by scholarly elites after 1948 significantly challenged accepted narratives about Israel until the post-Zionist movement at the end of the 20th century. Second, the survey points to a particularly poignant flaw in the way elite liberal left American Jewish intellectuals related to Israel, both in terms of their ill preparation for the 67 war and also the hollow glow of their celebration of the triumph. Here in this context of American Jews in Israel, we are talking about an interesting and perhaps troubling disconnect between the grassroots organizationally active Jews who had worked steadily on Israel, Israeli issues since the 1950s, but didn't write books that would end up on our bookshelf, and the celebrated rabbis, thinkers, and writers whose post-67 books on Israel are on our shelf, but who lack the accumulated experience with Israel, warts and all, that was possessed by these organizational Jews. In a kind of disjointed but perceptible way, scholars in recent years have suggested that the idea that American Jews in the long 1950s decade, really leading up to 67, didn't know very much about Israel. Well, that's a dreadfully misleading presumption. Some sorts of American Jews were intensively engaged with precursors or early iterations of what became raucous post-67 issues of territorial concession, IDF, supposed IDF excess, or who was a Jew disputes. And they had a realistic, if incomplete, sense of the directions in which a construct, constructive Israeli-American Jewish dialogue about them might take. I am thinking here, for instance, of a recent dissertation by Matthew Berkman on the JCRC RC, NACRAC organization, Natan Aradin's portrayal of the 56 dis Sinai disengagement controversy, or the Kibya incident a few years before, and a few other studies. And I think that if you reread accounts or read accounts in, uh, on memoirs of American Jewish professionals and pro-Israel lobbyists written in real time or retroactively, you'll find informed, albeit opinionated, pre-1967 writing that really challenges myths about American Jewish inexperience or ignorance about Israel before 1967. When I wrote that sentence, I was actually thinking about Philip Klutzkin, who was very well known in Brandeis. The issue really belongs to the elite literati on the 6773 bookshelf. Owing to their erudition about Judaism and their courage in civil rights and anti-Vietnam mobilizations, these are the figures to whom American Jews most looked for guidance in the post-1967 period, but they ended up producing cliche-filled hagiography about the IDF victory. The American Jews who should have had the most to say about 1967 ended up saying the least. Third, Israeli volumes on the 6773 Jewish bookshelf reinforce one of the curious, reinforce one of the curious anomal anomalies about American Jewish Israeli cultural interaction, namely the fact that American Jews know relatively little about the vicissitudes of Jewish ethnicity in Israel, about struggles in the 1950s Mabaro transit camps and related and related later Mizrahi Ashkenazi controversy. The late 1960s was a period when underclass Mizrahi activists were most noticeably influenced by cutting edge, tread, cutting edge trends in American society, as evidenced by the name Black Panthers adopted by an influential Mizrahi protest group. Still in this 67-73 moment, and in terms of Israel's Mizrahi literati, the timing was off. Nothing on our bookshelf really promoted rethinking about social fairness in Israel, or enhanced understanding about Jewish ethnicity in Israel among American Jews. Fourth, for the labor Zionist left, our bookshelf points to an issue of form. When these books are read half a century later, it is hard to dispute that some of the labor affiliated writers had a precocious sense of what was going on, and they proffered reasonable action plans for the then foreseeable future. The problem was that they lacked the right form, the right vehicle for getting their message across. Of course, I won't be talking only about the kibbutzim here, but the, that labor Zionist institution can be seen as a metaphor for the point I'm trying to make. To many minds, including my own, the then regnant brand of Zionism, that is labor Zionism, came to 1970-67 with a reasonably compelling liberal left viewpoint, 
but its institutional support for that outlook, such as the kibbutzim, was justifiably seen as being outdated and increasingly irrelevant. Fifth, breakdowns in world Jewish culture after 67 are largely reducible to conflicting ideas about Jewish masculinity that were consolidating at that time in Israel and among American Jews. About halfway through the preparation of this talk, I discovered horrifyingly that my bookshelf was an all boys club. So I quickly reached for Cynthia Ozick or other kinds of uh, texts. But in the end, I, de I decided that the top heavy masculine character of this bookshelf is precisely the point, or at least the point that I wanna make. 1967 pointed to a crisis in Jewish culture because the contrast between anti-Vietnam Jewish hippies and IDF heroes forced the issue, requiring everyone to notice how, the two, how in the two centers of post-Holocaust Jewish life, they had, both centers had radically different ideas of what it meant to be a man. Six, the most revealing voice books on this shelf, which point to the rise of the Zionist religious right and of the settlement movement, are not really about theology. Far too often, this controversial and increasingly dominant portion of Israel's post-1967 landscape is told as a mostly one-dimensional affair, as the father-son story of Abraham, Isaac, and Svi Yehuda Cook, or as belonging to Israel's political party culture, or as a kind of accidental empire standoff between an exhausted and rather inept labor party elite and several determined settlers at Sebastia, whose outcome resulted from opportunism, hypocrisy, and a dash of clerical error. Some of the most telling books on our shelf are runs which are drenched in post-1967 chuva religiosity and right-wing politics, but are really talking about economics, masculinity, and many other topics, in addition to being obsessive about a putative greater Israel right of territorial expansion. Taking several examples from our 6773 book bookshelf, I will associate a number of volumes with these broad, sometimes provocative points in descending order. That is working backwards from the sixth point and working up to the first one. Eliezer Livnay's 1972 polemical volume titled Israel and the Crisis of Western Civilization is somewhat well known as a text that reflects this kind of tshuva, born again revivalism on the political right among writers and political activists who had heretofore been associated with the secular labor Zionist Mapai establishment. Dan Miron's article, To Dat Be Israel, depicting how several well known labor Zionist figures or family relations of such figures signed semi messianic petitions after 1967, defiantly asserting that not even democratically elected Israel, Israeli governments had a moral right to concede newly conquered territories of the historic Eretz Yisrael Shlema homeland is a social and political context that frames Livne's book. And the book's contents, its overdrawn contrast between the decadent West of the late 1960s and the rooted sacredness of, sacredness of Israel and its triumphant recent victory are not subtle and don't really warrant comment. Those of, you, those of you who are young enough to be around, to have been around this campus at the time in the 1960s would quickly catch the book's moralistic tone by looking at his caricature of Brandeis activists in this period. More enlightening, I think, is to view such a book in the frame of its author's career. As it turns out, the most emphatic neg negation of the diaspora, anti-American, neo-religious, and precociously pro-settler book on our shelf was written by a figure who was deeply ambivalent about Americanization. Livnay had previously written about American Jews, but more importantly, in the early 1950s, he had managed to get himself ostracized, virtually excommunicated by the, by the Mapai elite by using inherited capital to finance a garishly American private home for himself, as mentioned in Anat Hellman's recent interesting study about Israeli consumerist attitudes towards Americanization. Deganya Pinat Hollywood. Viewed in this biographical light, while Livnay's 1971 volume is full of anti-American invective and is thus ostensibly to be read as a renunciation of forbidden fruit once ingested by its own author, I think it can be read more broad broadly as evidence of the complex cat and mouse game that has been played between, on the one hand, nationalist Jewish pride, and on the other hand, Israeli dependence on American support with the settlements in the middle. That is, as evidence of the volatile and complex interaction between settlements and Americanization that has culminated thus far 
with a high-tech millionaire prime minister who speaks fluent English and who served as director of the Yesha Settlement Council and with American-style suburbanized settlements like a fraud. I will end this discussion by referencing Portnoy's complaint, but as a kind of telegraphic justica justification of the fifth point made above about 1967 as a Jewish masculinity crisis, it will suffice here to cite a revealing Israeli novel from this period. On the eve of the 73 Yom Kippur War, Natan Shacham published a novel called in English, Round Trip, which details the misadventures of a young kibbutz widow in London, where she is settled in a one-year recuperative trip in which she hopes to overcome the grief of the combat death of her husband and temporarily escape from the social pressures of life on a communal settlement. Shacham's writing generally relates to dilemmas felt by protagonists about kibbutz life. In this novel, his heroine's kibbutz life is strained by family drama. Her father is the type of strident ideologist who turns trifling tea kettle or bikuhe kum kum um, arguments about personal property possession into existential crusades, whereas her ideologically lax mother impishly purchases home adornments to compromise her husband's abstemious labor Zionist philosophies. A didactic moralistic writer, Shacham follows in this novel a plot line where his here heroine's return to her home kibbutz after a disappointing London sojourn can be anticipated from the start. Yet nothing in the novel is uplifting, neither its, settling in London, its setting in London, whose dark colorings project the author's highly ideological negation of the diaspora outlook, nor the flashback re recollections of its heroine's kibbutz life have any sort of positive magnetic pull. The novel's criticism of London's 1967 radicalism are uncompromising and often rather crude. So as not to lose credibility among his comrades in, the kibbutz, in, his, in his own kibbutz's communal dining hall, who must have evinced some sort of interest in women's liberation or student activism or other 1960s trends, Shacha made an effort to insert a few semi-positive vignettes about his her heroine's encounter with London's youth culture but he stacked the deck and these scenes feel contrived, almost juvenile. The novel's Israeli heroine falls for a globe-trotting Gentile French doctor who battles against famine in Biafra, and in the novel's one sex scene, comes into our Israeli woman's bed in a hotel in Paris, wearing a blood-stained shirt after participating in a radical rally with students. Liat, has a, the, the heroine, the Israeli, has a one-night tryst with this saintly goy apparently as a kind of reward for enduring the torment of 1960s diaspora life in London for a year. Shacham's intention is to describe what liberated sex feels like, but his writing is stilted and diagnostic, not a motive. The sex scene can be read as the inverse of the notorious bedroom comedy in Philip Ross Portnoy's Complaint, wherein an American Jewish male protagonist is rendered impotent by the preachy socialism and unbearable machismo of Israeli society. In Shacham's novel, an Israeli heroine is theoretically fulfilled in the emasculated diaspora, but the effect is temporary and the scene is ineptly rendered. Both sex scenes, Ross and Shacham's, betray feelings of Jewish liberal impotence in a 1960s, 1960s period that put a premium on self-empowerment. My fourth point related to the post-1967 decline of labor Zionism as a problem of form. Two books on our shelf exemplify this line of interpretation. One is a 1970 volume, which was translated in English under the title An, An Israeli in the Court of St. James by Hanoch Bartov. Bartov had developed unusually deep interest in Israeli diaspora relations between 67 and his fictional and non-fictional writing about the US and Jewish Americans has attracted some scholarly attention. Barely in his 40s at the time of the Six Day War, Bartov had nonetheless made his mark in Israeli fiction well before 67, thanks to moving depictions of his, count, of his encounter with concentration camp survivors during his days with the British Army's Jewish Brigade, and also his 1954 novel, I think quite an important novel, called Everyone at Six Wings, at Six Wings, Sex Wings, a Freudian slip there, mostly about his wife's experience in a Mabara transit camp located near what became a posh area of Jerusalem, was readapted on the Israeli stage and also translated and utilized as a significant item of earlier Israeli public relations haspara. 
Bartold therefore wrote after 1967 with some authority as a well-connected patriotic Israeli leftist who happened to have who happened to have started his stint as a cultural attaché in Israel's London, London embassy when the 67 war erupted. Unlike the diaspora dismissive Shacham, Bartov was attentive to London's 1960s culture. And happily, there are even a few relatively praising comments about the Beatles in his memoir. You also articulate a number of promising ideas for the Jewish future. I'm convinced that he has the skeletal uh, form of birthright. And he talks about a university for Jewish students from overseas. I think more importantly also, his memoir provides colorful descriptions about Anglo Jews and sympathetic Christians rallied in support of Israel in days before the outbreak of the Six Day War. But unusually, you see those descriptions all the time. And in the book also has a lot of descriptions about the, his feelings as an Israeli leftist, that not enough work had been done to make connections with the European left in an era after, and he realizes that after 67, when the European left is becoming a rather anti-Zionist viewing Israel as a colonial power. All told, this was an effective volume, but its contemporary reality, but, but in the, its own contemporary reality, it reached the wrong shelves of the bookstores, being packaged as a travel memoir and not as what it really was, a significant nonfiction exposition of Israel's new place in the world after 67. A yet more poignant problem of form is raised by Arye Luba Eliav's 1972 tome, Eretz Tzvi, the only title here which actually refers to land, which becomes, of course, a dominant issue. His volume had a well-known published publishing history. At the start of the 1970s, Eliav had a power broker position as secretary general of the still hegemonic labor party when he published a pro-peace pamphlet and gained international notoriety including a Time magazine profile as a dovish Israeli politician. Prime Minister Golda Meir was outraged by Eliav's advocacy of territorial concessions in brief of party discipline, and she summoned him for a drubbing. In what's called in Israel nowadays a uh, Mapai compromise, the two worked out an arrangement whereby Eliav would emphasize in public that his political views were his own and not necessarily the labor parties. Kind of ridiculous, ridiculous because he was the secretary general of the party. This arrangement, of course, soon collapsed, and Eliav quit his party post and then spent a year at Tel Aviv University writing his manifesto. The linchpin of Eliav's program was its call for unilateral Israeli a unilateral Israeli declaration of its intention not to hold the 1967 territories over time. Instead of pretending that Jewish sovereignty could be democratically established throughout these lands, Israel's government should take the initiative and announce that it would be satisfied under workable peace accords to return to the pre-67 Green Line territories. In hindsight, Eliav can be faulted for a large dose of na na naivete in his anticipation of positive chain reaction effects subsequent to such a unilateral land, land for peace Israeli declaration of intent. His expectation of how such a declaration would bring about a thaw in Soviet Russia's anti-Israel activity in the Middle East, probably being one of them. But I think there was as much profit as Pollyanna in his prognostication. His book's explanations of likely effects of a unilateral announcement of Israel's willingness to withdraw from the Sinai Peninsula upon the Sadat regime's policies in its proclaimed 1972 year of decision are a case in point in this other prophetic direction. From the standpoint of contemporary liberal Israelis and American Jews, no other book on our shelf pointed as lucidly and presciently to a possible path of peace for Israel. And the way this book's prescriptions were adopted by the Labor Party two decades after their promulgation can be readily seen by such readers in retrospect as a tragic delay and as a missed opportunity. Eliav wrote in a time-honored autodidactic tradition of Jewish writing in which since the, the mid-19th century, a Haskalah, enlightened Jewish intellectuals felt compelled to produce monumental texts that putatively answered every conceivable problem, rather than focusing on the one particular issue of their own interest. Hence, rather than focusing on his recommendation of a labor government formal declaration of Israel's disinterest in annexing the conquered 67 territories, that is a formula that might have preempted the irredentist bluffing about annexation displayed by subsequently coup governments, he released a ponderous volume with long chapters on economics, the Cold War, Arab politics, and Soviet Jewry were never taken seriously. I dare say nobody watching this now has ever really read the book. 
looking out to a future in which politics would become sound bites, he peddled a political encyclopedia. Our third point contends that Jewish ethnic discourse on the 6773 bookshelf had bad timing, precisely at a time in America when Jewish and other minority activists were intelligibly leveraging their own ethnic identities to lodge important critiques about the conformist homogeneity of the melting pot. Mizrahi writers in Israel were moving in the opposite direction, at least for this moment. This strategy of melding Mizrahi identity to a supposedly colorblind, patriotically egalitarian Israel, Israeli ethos called Mamlach Tiyud proved to be self-defeating. Israeli scholars such as Sami Shalom Shitri have provided detailed analyses showing how, in general, disappointed hopes of empowerment following the 67 war catalyzed and escalated Mizrahi protest movements in Israel. Still, what is conspicuous in our bookshelf is this pre-disillusionment disillusionment, disillusionment expectation. Precisely in this high-charge brief 67-73 period, ordinary, ordinarily militant Mizrahi writers falsely hoped that Ashkenazifying their identities in the Mamlach Tiyut melting pot was a viable path of empowerment. Shimon Balis belongs to an outstanding cadre of Israeli Iraqi authors, but in terms of language writing choices, narrative plot lines, and political pronouncements, he stayed to the political left of counterparts in this group, such as Eli Amir and Sami Mikhail. Generally, he presented his self identity as an Arab Jew as a presumed corrective to various conventional Zionist perceptions. His important pre 1967 novel, Amabara, 1964, features blistering depictions of Mizrahi life and immigration to transit camps. Concurrently, it obliges Israel's state building norms of nonpartisan Mamlach Tiyut state building by showing how veteran Israelis and newcomers of various ethnic castes can, in the end, pull together. This pre 1967 novel by Balas, in other words, is a very complicated and very good book, very interesting kind of cross currents. But on our bookshelf, Balas's 1972 novel, Kid Barut, which I'll call here Elucidation, does not, I don't think, match this high level. Mamlach Tiyut in it becomes what the kibbutz is in Shacham's novel, something that the marginalized hero must come back to and oblige. But in both cases, there is nothing in this prescription that inspires, the, or the, that inspires and enthuses the hero or heroine. Bodice's novel features an early a protagonist in his early 30s, a patriotic Israeli whose Iraqi descent is mentioned only in faint, oblique ways. A civil engineer, this hero had most mustered out of the IDF reserves before the 1967 war due to a heart ailment. Restless after the IDF does not call him up for active duty during the war, he signs up for state-sponsored engineering work. Drory then spends his time in the novel designing bridges and roads in areas of the Sinai Peninsula and around Nablus and the Gaza Strip, putting down the infrastructure for what left-wing critics in Israel and overseas would soon condemn as an iniqu iniquitous conquest. In view of Balas's well-known leftist reservations about Zionism, this apparent apathy about the implication of the 67 con conquest in elucidation seems anomalous. One searches the text for hints of existentialist maneuvering by which moralism is condemned as bourgeois sanctimony, but it is not clear that Balas's intent is to project such philosophical skepticism about the authenticity of condemning the cruelty of foreign occupation, a la Albert Camus' presentation of murder in The Stranger. I think a simpler line of interpretation applies to this novel. Even though elucidation uses the 1967 war as prop frames for its narrative, the novel's concern is simply not territorial conquest, but rather the pros and cons of Mizrahi Jews making it in Israel, in a melting pot whose rules had been constructed by the labor Zionist Ashkenazi elite. Balas's critique of these rules is noticeably constrained in this novel, especially in comparison to his 1967 novel. In this post-67 period, he apparently decided to some measure to give Mamlach Tiyud the, the benefit of the doubt. On to our second point, referring to the problematic place of American Jewish liberalism on the 6773 bookshelf. <clears throat> Ultimately, this issue reflects the fundamental contrast between how Jewish heroism was visualized in this period. In America, it's grassroots activism for civil rights and in protest against militarism in Vietnam, and in Israel, precisely as an extension of a triumphant military political establishment. In terms of icon iconography, 
the two communities renowned images in the mid 1960s period vivify this contrast. One being a triad of IDF generals proudly strolling in the newly liberated, from Israel's point of view, old city of Jerusalem. The other showing the radicalized rabbi, Abraham Joshua Heschel, locked in arms with Martin Luther King, bravely walking across the Selma Bridge. Heschel's award-winning 1970 volume, Israel, an Echo of Eternity, is thin in words, and if truth be told, thin on intellectual rigor. Probably more than any other, this text reflects the failure of a well-positioned American Jewish liberal to arrive at the mind-numbing Middle East events of 67-73 on the basis of serious study, actual knowledge, and sustained reflection. To my mind, it is easier to understand how Israeli leftist, leftist writers like Shacham, whose roots stretch into the misery of impoverishment and anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe, were clinging in this period to the dismissive ideology of diaspora negation, than it is to fathom how estimable and admirable American Jewish, Americanized Jewish liberals like Heschel could view Israel's complicated reality through a narrow prism of schmaltz and nostalgia by which Moshe Dayan became a gun-toting tevya and not really face serious pushback for this false sentimentality. Heschel's analysis pivots on an illiberal premise. Being a miraculous occurrence, Israel, unlike other countries, cannot be subjected to rational criticism. Quote, the state of Israel is a surprise, yet the modern mind hates to be surprised. The return to Zion is an unprecedented drama, an event for which there is no model. The, re in, in the return to Israel is a miracle in disguise, unquote. Jews were an exclusively positive presence in Edwards Israel, and any other nation settlement in it was a curse. Quote, Palestine can never become a national home for any other people. Other nations left a, a legacy of slaves and soldiers in the country up to the 19th century when the land, quote, had sunk bank it back in the oblivion of swamp in the north and eroded soil and sand in the south. The book's reckoning with new left critiques of post-67 as, embryon, as embryonic colonialism is listless and declaratively mechanical. Quote, the, Jew, the Jews of Israel are not an outpost of any foreign domination. Their ambition is to integrate themselves into the modern structure of reviving Asia, unquote. His account of the 48 experience was spoon-fed by Israel's Hasbara establishment, but what I find striking in the following package is its false and arrogant empiricism, which belies the book's overall thesis holding that Israel is a miraculous occurrence toward which standard types of argumentation do not apply. Quote, Arab leaders claim that the state of Israel is responsible for the Arab refugee problem. However, according to indisputable and abundant evidence, the refugee traffic was largely stimulated and encouraged by Arab leadership itself, unquote. Heschel's book contained factually doctored anecdotes about how the Arab-Jewish conflict evolved in the British mandate period, including a dubious story about how Rabbi Ben Sion Uziel forestalled Palestinian violence during 1921 riots in Jaffa, thanks to his charismatic preaching. Such tall tales awkwardly transposed romanticized admiration for the Hasidic tzaddikim to the rough reality of the Arab-Jewish conflict. A justifiably revered Jewish liberal, and I point out that what I've said now does not encompass the entirety of what I think about Heschel. A justifiably revered Jewish liberal, Heschel in this context, left a troubling legacy to young Jewish American Jewish activists who had tried to understand subsequent violent phases in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and defend Israel's action to the world at large. In effect, he told them that it sufficed to rely on sentimentalized images of Jewish heroism without checking the facts. We end by returning to our first point. What larger points might be drawn from the fact that the sole classic on our bookshelf, the sexual comic novel, Port Noise Complaint, ends in a bedroom of violent assault against Israel. Was Roth being peculiarly hyperbolic in the expression of skepticism about Zionist myths of national fulfillment? Was he a one-of-a-kind literary gadfly on this Israeli-American Jewish axis? Or alternatively, was he inaugurating a comic genre in which American Jewish literata use images of sexual violence to distance themselves from Israeli politics and society? Half a century has gone by, but how distant is the ending of Portnoy's complaint from the conclusion of Joshua Cohen's 2021 
Pulitzer Prize winning snarky novel, The Netanyahu's, which arguably leverages rape as a way of debunking a quintessential symbol of Israeli military valor at Entebbe. As critics like Terry Eagleton have argued, rape in prominent literary texts, particularly when it is not recognized as such in their reception, necessarily reflects sharp social breakdown in relations between specific groups. As a symbol of breakdown in liberal discourse between American Jews and Israelis, I end this discussion with a reminder of the ending of Portnoy's complaint. And I remind you, first of all, about the status of Portnoy's complaint, which is easily the most impactful and creatively compelling text on our bookshelf. By the mid-1970s, some 4 million paperback and hard copies of Ruth's novel had been sold, and the comic novel regularly appears on lists of the 20th century's top 100 books. The novel ends with the narrator's attempted rape of a 21-year-old kibbutz-raised woman named Naomi, the daughter of Jewish immigrants from Philadelphia, who would be perceived as a poster child of Jewish idealism in Hasbara volumes produced by most of the Israeli writers on our bookshelf. Everything in the scene seems disturbingly con contrived. The way Portnoy wrestles Nomi to the ground is patently related to an earlier scene in the novel, wherein Portnoy's own uncle pins to the ground his own son, Heshi, brutally trying to dislodge him from a relationship with a Gentile girlfriend. Nomi's appearance is repeatedly depicted as being similar to that of Portnoy's mother, Sophie. And Nomi's perorations about the evils and injustices of Jewish life in the American Galut have a Stalinist staccato, reminiscent of print in labor Zionist pot newspapers uh, like Devar, but unlike anything that an Israeli could possibly have said in a hotel room, Trist. At the end of Portnoy's complaint, Israel appears not as a living country, but as a variable in a polemical theorem, an equation holding that Jewish parents violently assault exogamy, just as Jewish children violently wrestle with the tribal dicta dictates of endogamy. The novel's mostly omniscient narrator, who has apparently been lying on the couch of his psychiatrist, Dr. Spielbogel, while conveying the slapstick entirety of his complaint, seems unaware that the story's concluding mathematics are as cold as the Zionist propaganda he puts into Naomi's mouth. No better, the surrogate rape of Portnoy's mother discalibrates the novel's creative balance. Before the Israel scenes, any, re any reader can discern and empathize with the narrator's love for a mother he can't stop complaining about. But this artful ambivalence is thrown into Haifa Bay when Portnoy rapes or tries to rape the good Jewish girl his mother always wanted for him, who was also his mother. That miserable ending is Roth's characteristically provocative challenge to us today. For when American Jewish liberals finally find it impossible to talk about Israel decently within the frame of emancipated civility, and that day seems soon to come, if it has not come already, why won't that be matricide? All right, thank you uh, very much. Um, uh, I think uh, we'll offer first chance at any questions to people here in the room, and then we'll shift over uh, for questions uh, from the Zoom audience. Any questions, comments, Professor K? Um, thanks so much. That was so um, such a great paper because it was both um, fun and also um, beautifully structured. So um, thank you so much for it. So I have uh, two questions, and um, both of them are irritating. Um, <laughs> and and um, but hopefully they'll at least give you um, something to to sort of engage with. Um, um, the, one of the books, which this is why this question is irritating, it doesn't actually fit because I think it came out in 77, um, that I had in mind was Waltz's Just and Unjust Wars, okay. which of course is not explicitly about Israel, but the just war is the 1967 war. So it comes a, a little bit late, but I wonder if it might be, you know, unlike Eschel's engagement, I think it's reasonable to say whether or not you agree with it, it's a uh. serious philosophical engagement with the with the consequences of the war and sort of its broader broader application. And the second the second question I have um, um, irritating for the same kind of reason is 
is I, I wondered about the time span that you that you gave the 67 to 73 time span. And obviously, you you know, if you if you extend past 73, then other things have happened which may you know change the picture. So it makes sense. I, I can see why you chose that time span. I'm just thinking about how long it takes people to write novels and um, sort of if that six year span is, is like, what do it, if you, why is it reasonable to sort of limit um, such a short time span for sort of um, narrative reflections on what will happen? Yeah, you know, there's a great question. I guess I should take the, the first one uh, uh, first. A lot of things are gonna come out, especially after 73, a lot of reflections, a lot of groups, peace-oriented groups, and, People who are studying this history know them very well, but are on all sorts of also very interesting books that aren't necessarily about uh, Israel, um, but have Israeli poor passions. Charles Liebman wrote, uh, writes an important book, The uh, Ambivalence of an American Jew, it's called that comes out in 73. Um, and every, um, in, but I think what's interesting about Heschel, particularly, and it's very hard for me to have written like that about somebody I you know so much admire. Um, is how long liberal discourse here is really dictated by what, what Israel, Israel wants the American Jews to stay, uh, uh, right? And it's very clear that that's coming out in what, what Heschel is saying. And I can understand that. I mean, there's a great admiration, there's great enthusiasm after, after 67. Um, but I, I think the book, which really points out how some of this continues after 73, is Saul Bellow's book, To Jerusalem and Back. Um, Bellow sometimes would sign these, these anti-settlement, not really settlement, sometimes he would position himself to the left, not always, of course. And Bellow's book, um, also Heschel, one thing I'm being very unfair to him, see, I think he passed away in 72. This is a very, very late book uh, uh, for him. Um, Bellow put a tremendous amount of work uh, into, into the book. And uh, I was reading it while I was writing actually about the Galilee and he describes a meeting with a professor who had written about Joseph Caro. And it's just so perceptive and he's reading everything. Um, but I, as somebody who, you know, as I was getting to academia as one of my moonlighting jobs, I used to work for Teddy Kollek and the Jerusalem Foundation and Mishka Shananim. And it's clear that even in Bellow's case, such an independent guy, he's really with the program. It's really, it's like the model book of what Israel would want somebody like that to stay. Um, I think when you talk about walls or other people, I think that's getting broken down already. It's a discourse where American Jews are taking the liberty with a lot of heartfelt agony about that. What is our right? I mean, Israel, Israelis are paying the price and so on. Um, but it, I think in the Hessel case, that's a truly controlled kind of uh, discourse. Um, about your other question, you know, I've written a lot of books and a lot of books. <laughs> Sorry, um, in Hebrew and English, and every book has its own gestation and, and creative process. But you can really rechange things. You can even in those days when it wasn't as easy the way things are formatted and about the computerization. I think seventy three. I think I was interested in looking how writers are coming to terms with this incredible, unexpected triumph, and how that's going to shape their views. And after seventy three, of course, that perception changes. I think the ultimate question you ask me as, as scholars always have this kind of dilemma, how strictly you abide by your research thing. What were Jews writing about in this frame? And that's what I'm going to talk about. So let me ask a question and then we'll move over to uh, the, the um, uh, virtual audience, uh, uh, the audience uh, in the four corners of the world. But I've been sitting here trying to think, as Professor Kay has, of a single case where the great book about a war was written just five or six years later. So the great work on World War I, by remark, all quiet on the Western Front, that uh, begin, begins to appear in 1928 much longer after the end of World War I. Uh, you wrote on Exodus, not quite at the same level <laughs> as Remark, but nevertheless seen at its time. Uh, and that too is ten years, ten years after uh, 48. And one could 
um, uh, much of the great work on the Civil War really is pushed off till uh, much later in the 19th century when they look back at it. So I'm I'm wondering whether, you know, it just like great history requires a certain distance and uh, objectivity and that, you know, maybe we shouldn't expect that in the immediate aftermath, we'd have more than a, a, a kind of immediate books, maybe a certain kind of journalism, but that um, many years later, one would have a, a deeper and a more uh, pointed uh, treatment. Yeah, that's, a great, that's a great point. I, I've been thinking about how Israelis wrote about their our own wars. I think a, an interesting example is the 48 war. You take Uri Avneri, who begins the war really on the right, and, and then he's going to be moving over to the left. He writes very quickly. Uh, two mm -hmm. books, but with exact opposite viewpoints. Right, one is a is a is a soldier's kind of diary and really pointing to the heroism and the beshitre and falist. It's like they cut off the Palestine, um, which is a very kind of pro patriotic book. And then a few months later, because he didn't like the responses, he thought that they were overly zealous and patriotic. He writes a very critical book called The Other Side of the Coin. Uh, which includes, uh, <laughs> he'd be in trouble for writing that kind of book about the IDF today with a lot of uh, circles of, of Jews around the world. Um, so it's hard to process these things. I, I was looking and and just for kind of specific recognition of how complicated the realities were becoming, that our Jewish sense of elation and relief and triumph, which is a totally justifiable emotion in, in my mind, how quickly um, responses were changing in Europe among the left, and whether somebody like, in the, I think the Bartov case, you could recognize that at the time, but it just doesn't enter the general discourse. It doesn't. Rima. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Silver. Thank you, Professor Sarna. And I would like to remind everyone to type your question in the chat box if you have any questions. You can't hear me. I'm not heard well. Okay. All right. Thank you. So I actually, my name is Rima. I'm a, I'm a doctoral student at the New Eastern and Judaic Studies, and I will have a couple of questions for you. Okay. So you've talked about, um, at the beginning, you know, about Israel being divided in right and left. And, you know, after 1967, it was um, expected or anticipated that the Mizrahim will be uh, more included in the state. Because they participated in the war, it, there was an understanding that their Israeli Jewish identity would be more legitimate, legitimated. And they will be more uh, included because also the economy in Israel after 1967, it was uh, blooming. So, uh, but what happened actually is that after 1967, they were, they stay, they kind of like stay, they remained in the margins and they were referred to or associated with kind of non-Jewish ethnic identities. They continue to be associated this way, such as like maybe Arabs, Orientals, Mizrahim, and all these things. And, and, and they became also associated with the right wing. They became the right wing. And, uh, and the Ashkenazim are the left wing. And you, yes, so the left and right thing, the left. Well, there are cousins, yeah. well, lots of subgroups. A yes, a lot of subgroups, but somehow this became kind of a division clear after 1967. And um, interesting that I would like to know the literature um, among the American liberal Jewish authors on specifically on the ethnic identity of the Jews after 1967, because I think maybe as liberals in Israel, when we say liberal, when we talk about left, left is more. Um, associated with or referred to origin and socioeconomic status rather than, you know, the way it is in America with uh, liberal ideas and liberal thoughts. Okay. So at that time, we look at the Jewish literature and the Jewish authors, how did they mention or, re or refer to the Jews uh, in Israel, the Mizrahim specifically, when they referred to their identity as being Israeli and Jewish? What was the there were actually that's a good question. I think there are also yeah. other questions leading up to the yeah. to where okay. I, to, to where you end up. I think the Balas novel I referred to is a very specific moment when maybe there is still this hope that 
this could really benefit us. You know, Israel's a strong uh, winning nation. That ends very quickly. Uh, um, but it didn't make my time frame. Sami Mikhail writes this uh, book with a sarcastic animal farm title. Some are equal, but some are others are more equal than others, which is just a furious book about what the, the Mizrahi experienced in the 1950s. He literally burns down a Mahara in that book, but that comes after 73 and it comes after the disillusionment that uh, if we're speaking of our Mizrahi Jews, we're not reaping the benefits of this great triumph. All sorts of specific claims that they have, you know, why are they giving these special benefits to the Jews from the, from the Soviet Union yeah. when we didn't get them, they put us in transit camps, yeah. all sorts of stuff. Going on there, but uh, as I hinted, nah, you know, if Shimon Balas were alive to respond to me, it would be interesting. I think that he got caught up in the enthusiasm also, and, I, and I'm hinting that. But it's so odd that he writes about a character who's actually, from his point of view, not my own. Yeah. He's he's writing about somebody who's contributing to a conquest, right? Yeah. Right, right. Which is uh, um, American Jews and Mizrahim. I think that that probably will be a sub chapter in the book. I'm, yeah. I'm here. I'm, I'm, I come here to, to write. Very complicated story, but um, actually, I had invited Bernard Abishai to, to hear this because I talked a lot about Portnoy's complaint. I think that too easily among the American Jewish left, the explanation for what happens in 77, when you see a different ideology coming to power, one that liberal American Jews have much more of a problem with. Uh, blaming very quickly that it's all the Mizrahim fault and these are people who don't have experience with democracy and so on. I think that that might be a regretted uh, um, point of view today. I'd have to ask Kavi Shai and other people who expressed that at the time. Um, there's a lot of interesting scholarship coming out about how the American Jewish organizations were involved in the immigration waves in the 1950s from Yemen. Mm -hmm. um, Israeli scholars are very tough on the American Jewish organizations. There's one book which is just scathing about how I mean, this is just prejudice, viewing these Jews as blacks, not, not caring whether they're dying en route to the desert. It's a difficult, it's a difficult um, point of view to sustain because they're actually helping, in their minds, these Yemenite Jews achieve what they wanted to, to come. Um, yeah, a large part of the answer to the question you asked is, is sheer ignorance. And I, I actually referred to that uh, here. It wasn't in the interest of the fundraising apparatus here to talk about how, but that changes. That changes in the 70s. The, the Jewish agency had project renewal programs to work with the Mizrahi populations. Um, you know, that, the, the question you asked, I think, is still a work in progress, but I hope it gets better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have one question here. Um, what influence does the Holocaust have on these books as a subtext? I think everything. <laughs> I think I, I really think that uh, that uh, um, Bartov. I think he changed uh, completely because of that incident that refers to where he where he sees survivors. Very important book. It's called um, Adolescent Pimples or something in, in Hebrew. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, um, and I, I think that um, he's unusually open and curious about what's happening in American Jews and really, although he can do it in a very sustained way because this idea of negating the diaspora is so powerful in that culture, but you can see him wrestling with that. Also in novels that he writes after the book I talk about, and one called In the Middle of the Novel, I think it's called in, in English, uh, where he talks a lot, a lot about America. I think that's a, a response to how him, harsh Israeli culture was to Holocaust survivors in the 1950s. I think that's a subject that's probably well known uh, here. Um, in terms of Mizrahi writing about the Holocaust, that's a very interesting story. And, and the people I mentioned here, Ali and Amir and Sami Mikhail later have very interesting uh, reckonings with it. Heschel, for obvious reasons. Is, I think that's really one of the reasons why he's just so elated after what happens in 67 in terms of his own background. So it's absolutely everywhere. Um, that's the conclusion I'm gonna, I'm, I have a book in mind where I think I'm gonna be reaching conclusions which aren't now in the scholarly consensus, but I think the template is going to be that the only way to understand all of this is the Holocaust context. And if you, you know, it's interesting because during that period of time, when you talk about the literature, about books, about authors that, within a specific period of time, you think all these Jewish authors, whether American or Israeli, who of course lived after that period of time, when they, do they have any publications 
or any response to what they wrote during that time, during the events, because things change, events developed. And it's really interesting to take that period of time and compare it off what they have, what they have written or wrote after that period of time about their own insights, about their the way they, they saw things during that time. Because so many things happened, wars, um, a lot of tension. So here you're asking great questions, and I'm smiling just because I didn't want to mention this because I have so much admiration for Allah Pet Yeshua, yeah. whose book I I I, I referred to here. Um, the dominant perception of labor where he's affiliated at the time is that this new what we what the left came to call a conquest, and they, the most famous title is from a book by Shaftai Tevet, the blessing of the curse or the curse of the blessing. It's kind of a mixed story. Um, they don't want to say this so specifically, but it's going to be better for the Palestinians. Moshe Dayan is opening up the bridges. There's more contact now. It's kind of a benign conquest, which is not a popular view to take in the late 1960s, given what's happening in the left in the world. I don't think Yeshua, even though I think that I mentioned a, a book here, he's challenging a lot of conventional premises. He never challenges that. And then 15 years later, during the first Intifada, he and Amos Alon and Amos Oz and one other writer who I'm forgetting now are vehemently objecting to American Jews who are keeping quiet when what's going on in the territories. And it's time for them to speak up. When I read that, I thought, well, why? You know, he was pretty quiet in 67 himself. Um, so these are uh, profoundly complicated. And they also ultimately come back to how off to what extent you're going to wash your own culture's dirty laundry in public. That's, that's the ultimate question. Yes, we do have a question here. What would you say is the guiding question of this project? Are you looking at American Jews looking at Israel? I want to write a book about American Jews in Israel, the portrait of today. It's an overwhelming idea to have because there's just so much out there and there's so many things that are complicated. What I was interested in doing today, I. I Olive, I'm still thinking in Hebrew sometimes. Um, I just like interesting Jewish books written by interesting people, but I'm also um, testing out uh, testing out a, metho a methodology on this. That um, what kinds of findings and how much of a swath of reality you get when you're looking at things from a high uh, level. And I think this kind of paper, uh, you know, answers a few questions, but. Uh, can be done. Um, um, I'm going to have to, you know, you, you have to look at the organizations, you have to look at the little people, you have to look at the media, um, non-Jews, there's so many different kinds of things. But I, I, you know, one of my teachers in my undergraduate days, I did my undergraduate work here on this side of the pond, was a great intellectual historian named Dominic Latapra. And he very much influenced me that, you know, you can do a lot of work if you take texts written by what's, what came to be called the elite. Um, so that was the approach I was using today. Um, one yes, one more um, just question. Uh, we are okay. More questions in the room, definitely. Yeah, if you have yeah, any yeah, questions, no, good, good, good. no, no. If you have any questions in the room, I don't have any time. Yeah, just one more question about whether uh, the books and uh, all um, the literature that was at that time um, did it really also refer to a liter literature of non-Jews who wrote about. That period of time, did there was there any reflection or interaction or any talk about how others saw also the this uh, looked at this time or about or their literature or how the Jews what were the Jews were going through dur during that time what was happening in Israel after 1967 how did they see the war was there any kind of you know mention of other literature or interaction yeah, right. no <laughs> these, are, was, these are great questions my my first response is a resounding no. And five minutes after we shut off the Zoom, I'm going to think about 10 examples yeah. where there is. Okay. I think there's an opportunistic uh, use made okay. of the Mark Twain kind of comments and so on. But I don't think there's as much interaction. There wasn't. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions in the room? All right. Um, I want to once again thank uh, uh, Professor Silver, and uh, he's given us a long agenda for books that we either need to reread or read for the first time uh, from uh, that important era. Um, and I think raised very significant issues that um, e each of each of which could be the subject of uh, a valuable seminar. 
Um, I want to invite everyone to join us again in two weeks on September the 15th for our next uh, seminar with Professor Michael Figueroa of the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, who will uh, be speaking about musical memorialism and the politics of bereavement in Jerusalem. Uh, a really a fascinating uh, subject. Uh, what do we learn from these very large funerals that take place? Uh, so join us for that. And I want to mention that a week afterwards, on September the 21st, uh, we are hosting um, uh, with the Vilna Shul and also co-sponsored by the Consulate uh, of Israel, uh, the Israeli culinary icon Uri Shet. Uh, it's called Breaking Breads with Israeli culinary icon Uri Shep. Uh, that will be held in person at the Vilna Shul uh, on 18 Phillips Street, but will also be live streamed um, uh, to anyone who signs up. And uh, our associate director, Dr. Shana Weiss, uh, will be talking um, uh, with um, uh, uh, Uri Sheft uh, about his family's journey and how he became a baker and restaurant entrepreneur. And, and of course, for members of our Boston audience, uh, know that he has opened up uh, recently uh, here in the city. We'll also um, uh, have for sale uh, his breaking bread uh, as well, and it's timely, uh, the Artisanal Kitchen Jewish Holiday Baking. So many programs uh, coming up at the Schusterman Center. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to, to Professor Silver and to Rima Farah. And I look forward to seeing you next time. I'm Jonathan Sinem. <laughs>